Welcome to the Unlist. <clears throat> this video is one that's probably been a long time coming because it's something that people have asked me about, but I didn't really want to talk about with any serious authority until I did a little more research, had a little more experience, uh, talked to perfumers that know more about this than I do, that have access to the paperwork and the regulations involving now I think I have a good enough idea that I can actually make a video that's not obviously the end all be all. There are things I'm going to forget or miss or overlook. Probably some things I may actually get wrong even, but I feel like I know enough now that I can make a video that's of some use to people concerning IFRA, I-F-R-A, International Fragrance Association. That's what it stands for. So, first things first, this is not a IFRA bashing video. I'm not here to bash IFRA. I'm here to talk about IFRA, what it is, what it does, the good and the bad, and some of the ugly too, right? I want to dispel a lot of the misinformation that circulates involving IFRA, and I also want to talk about what they do right and what they do wrong. And then lastly, I want to discuss, go over the real bogeyman that's negatively impacting perfumes as we know it via overregulation. See, that's the thing. Everyone, especially collectors, niche hobbyists, people into artisanal perfumes that use higher naturals, people into vintage fragrances, they're the ones that really go after Ifra, and they shouldn't. Because it's really not Ifra's fault that all of their favorite fragrances are reformulated into oblivion or have all the good stuff taken out, right? That's the thing you hear a lot. Uh, obviously, guys who are into designers and niche fragrances for compliments and sex appeal, they're doing it for the social media clout points and the clicks and the subscribes. And they just want to be popular and relevant. They don't give two fucks, okay? They don't. They don't give two fucks. They don't care if Oak Moss or Lilial is in their perfume or not. All they care about is, does it project? Do people tell them they're sexy? Do they get laid? Do they get lots of followers on Instagram? Do their TikToks go viral? You know, do they get the dopamines and the ass pats and the attaboys? And yes, you're awesome. Everyone loves you. All that ego tripping shit. That's all they care about. Those folks that buy that shit. And they don't care. So... We're strictly talking about the people that are on the more tastemaker, curated, collector side of the fragrance community, not the average person. You see, that's the thing here, guys. The average person also doesn't give two fucks about Ifra. In fact, the average person who is still buying a many times reformulated fragrance, right, Someone who is still buying brand new bottles of Dracar Noir, for instance, in 2024, they're probably not paying close enough attention to it. They might notice some things are different. They might say, oh, well, I remember it being a little more this, or I remember it being a little more that, but it's still good enough, right? They're going to be like, yeah, it still smells like it should. I still wear it. I get by. It's like... The sky isn't falling for those people. You know, like the guys who lifelong polo wearers. Yeah, they'll probably say the older bottles felt different, but they're not concerned, right? You know, women who've been wearing nothing but poison this whole time. Same thing. They, they don't care. They're not in it like that. But the collectors, the enthusiasts, again, the people who are really uh, in the weeds, right? The ones that care about batches and production runs do they have a sanofi bottle do they have a gucci group bottle right that whole thing that really tires me out by the way guys that that discussion off topic but the sheer pedantry of that and just the whole not a word guys but the whole like up their own acidness of that whole situation right it's like no one cares as much as you do 
and maybe the five other people that you talk to about this. Like, I was talking to one of my friends about it. It's like the comic book guy from The Simpsons, but worse. Because the comic book guy from The Simpsons is a snob and a gatekeeper. But he still wants to sell, per uh, not perfume, he still wants to sell comic books, right? The comic book guy is a snob and a gatekeeper, but he still wants to sell comics. He's just going to tell you which ones to buy and which ones not to buy, right? Don't buy this one. This is the day. You went, this is the best issue. Like, he's going to do that. He's going to push you into buying what he thinks you should be reading, right? But these people, if they were to run a perfume store, for example, they would literally not let you in the store unless you could answer the questions three, right? You'd walk in there looking for a bottle of Heritage or something or a bottle of Koros, and they'd be like, what's the best version of Koros? And even if you just happen to know that Charles of the Ritz was the first maker of Koros, right? Uh, and you say, yeah, it, it was the old uh, Charles of the Ritz bottles, right? Okay, what was the original batch code prefix and suffix of the numbers and then you would get that wrong because you don't fucking know that shit they'd say well then you can't buy any perfume good day sir they'd push you at the store and just close the door in your face right it's just the sheer pedantry and obsession those are the folks and they are a very very vocal minority there are literally youtubers who make their whole channel about that i don't want to name names because i don't want to get into fights with people but there are some YouTubers who really, they just don't get it. Like, the fragrances that you enjoy the smell of don't make you special. And your bottle isn't more special than someone else's bottle. What's special is the experience you have with them. So even if you wear a common-ass bottle of Stetson or a common-ass bottle of Old Spice that you bought from the supermarket if you find something special in that fragrance then it's special whether it's 10 days old 10 years old whether it's an abc one two three or whatever it, it just it's all about the connection you have with that thing in your hand is is that a special connection you have yes okay that is special no then you should probably wear something else that's the A and B of it, the end all, be all, starts and stops there. So, with that in mind, guys, with the mind set of your enjoyment of a fragrance is entirely how that fragrance affects you, you know, emotionally, how it stimulates your mind with the senses, you know, how you feel about wearing it day in and day out as it goes on. You know, whether it's you're wearing it to work, wearing it to a nightclub, or just sitting around the house playing video games while wearing it, whatever. It's it's that connection you have with that perfume. It's batches and vintages and materials. None of that stuff is going to improve or degrade your experience if you're already having that experience with that bottle. So... That's why it's important to understand if you enjoy what you have now and someone's telling you you have the wrong version of it, you should get an older bottle or a bottle with more sandalwood or the newer bottles have more this or that, you should tell them to just go shut the fuck up because you are too busy enjoying your bottle to worry about what they think. You know, Don't let them comic book guy you. And furthermore, if they go even beyond that and say well you don't actually wear the fragrance you don't know what the real fragrance is because you haven't smelled their approved bottle so the one you have is not the real deal so you've never actually experienced it just tell them to fuck off put your foot right up their ass block them i don't care if they're in the room with you slap them <laughs> smack them around you know do not invite them to the barbecue you know politely but firmly ask them to leave so, <clears throat> Ifra, therefore, if taken to the mindset of a person who has a more rational train of thought like that, who's not lost in the details, okay, of what is or isn't or should or shouldn't be, Ifra 
is just a advocacy group. It's an association, International Fragrance Association. It is a retail association of fragrance manufacturers, ingredient suppliers, okay, and distributors. It is no different than the Record Industry Association of America, or the RIAA. It is no different than the MPAA, you know, which does movies. It's no different than the ESRB, just for video games, all right? It is just an industry advocacy group. And yes, it does regulation, but the reason why it does regulation is it's a self-policing regulation, like the MPAA, like the RIAA, like the ESRB for movies, for recorded music, for video games. It's self-policing because government agencies, without that middleman, without that go-between, government agencies would probably just ban perfume completely, right? Especially in some countries that have really overreaching governments that really like to get in there and nanny state you about everything. Now, you see, this is where I'm going to mention the real bogeyman here, guys. The real threat to anything resembling enjoyable perfume. It's not IFRA. It's the SCCS, or Scientific Council of consumer safety a european union or eu governmental key difference here a european union governmental regulatory body it doesn't just do cosmetics and perfumes it does a lot of things but the sccs scientific council of consumer safety has really had a bug up its ass for the last 25 years really since the beginning of the 21st century has really had a bug up its ass about more or less stamping out perfume and cosmetics that contain scent like they really want to make it illegal to smell good more or less and the kind of draconian rules that they push for and the kind of restrictions and bannings they push for would basically make lvmh and chanel have to close their doors if they were to pass right they would, they would nuke out everything, you know, in name of safety. Because they, they're not okay with warning labels, right? Like, think about it. We put warning labels on our alcohol and our tobacco products, but we don't just ban them. We probably should with cigarettes, honestly. We probably should ban cigarettes, if you really think about it. But we just put warning labels on them. And then, like, Australia, they put ugly pictures to try and dissuade you from buying them. Like... The cigarettes in Australia are more like horrifying picture than actual advertisement anymore. But we do stuff like that, but we don't take them off the shelves. But they're like one person out of like one person out of like five million people might have a rash. Keyword here is one person out of five million might have a rash. So you can't have that material. Can't have it at all. Because one person out of five million might have a rash or might have a little sunburn if they go outside on like a 90 degree day when they probably shouldn't be outside wearing perfume anyway you know now some of the things i get you know like the ones that can be traced down to uh bioaccumulation in the water like the nitro musks were getting into the water supply and polluting the fish like with the mercury from the batteries i understand that stuff or like, uh, you know, Liliol causing reproductive harm. I mean, I still wonder, like, how much Lily of the Valley perfume do you have to wear before your baby comes out a mutant? Like, in the womb, like, comes out looking like a Toxic Avenger or something? I mean, what's the, what's that quantity? What is the amount of hydroxycitronellol and Liliol you have to put into a perfume? And a combination of everything, your, your lotions, I get it, your shampoos, your soaps. What is that amount of that material that you need to consume into your body before you spit out Toxie? Your baby is just straight up fucking Toxie from Toxic Avengers. Like how much of that perfume? I wonder if you can even achieve it in a lifetime. Can you even achieve that in a lifetime? 
I mean, what is that amount? It has to be a large quantity. It has to be a lot, right? But again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I can't say for sure, but it is not IFRA. It is the SCCS that is doing these things. What IFRA does, which is what really kills me, what IFRA does is they push back. They push back against that. They're like, no, we don't want you to completely ban our white floral materials. We don't want you to completely ban our oak moss, right? We don't want you to completely ban our clove and carnation materials. You know, we will fight to get a restriction in place of a ban. Each time a material has been restricted, that could have been a ban. If Think about that, guys. That could have been a ban. If Ifra wasn't there to push back, there'd be no eugenol in perfumes. There'd be no coumarin in perfumes. There'd be no citrus materials because they are uh, sensitizers as well. You, you wouldn't be able to have bergamot in a perfume. You wouldn't be able to have rose in a perfume. Okay? Like I said, the, the, the draconian governmental bodies would push to have all this stuff completely illegal. So you'd only be able to smell a rose by going to a rose bush and putting your face in it. That's it. You wouldn't be able to have rose in any form on your body. I mean, you could probably go to the black market and get some of that illegal rose oil now, now that it's banned, right? You'd have drug dealers on the corner pulling your jacket up and be like, hey man, got some essential oils right here, some hot stuff, you know. Got it off the truck, right? Don't get caught. If a cop sees you smelling like rose, he's going to give you a ticket. He's going to throw you in jail because you smell like tonka bean because it's illegal. That's where we'd be. That's that's how it would be if IFRA did not exist, okay? That's how it would be if IFRA did not exist. So you kind of have to count your blessings here. Yes, it is not fun and not cool that we can only use so much of some of our favorite materials, so much of our white musks, so much of our oak moss. And those amounts have been getting smaller and smaller. And yes, having to engineer around and create rectified versions of materials, rectified bergamot oil that's been vacuum distilled so it doesn't have as much citral in it, yeah, rectified oak moss that has had most of the atronol and chloroatronol removed so that it's uh, safe for use on skin you know having substitutes for liliol that are different materials altogether but have similar molecular structures it gets to be a nightmare you know but you also have to look at the sustainability side of it too a lot of your favorite materials are gone because we just chewed them all up and spat them out. Nobody wants to talk about that. Where did all the sandalwood oil go? I'll tell you where it all went. All the sandalwood oil, all the good Mysore oil from India got sucked up in the 80s and 90s. It had been a slowly building thing. You know, when they started and perfume was generally less popular, so they made less of it, they could just import sandalwood oil periodically Put it in their drugstore perfumes. Put it in their in their soap bars, whatever. You know, saying you had sandalwood oil in a perfume back in the fifties was not a big deal. Oh, okay, it's sandalwood oil. Okay, cool. Smells like sandalwood. Big deal, right? But then, as economies of scale blew up, and suddenly you were selling millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of these bottles of whatever, and everyone from Creed all the way down to Avon was using sandalwood oil suddenly there's not enough trees to go around not enough oil to go around and all the poachers and everything were taking more trees and now Santal albumin became an endangered species and the government said no you got to stop that we're not going to have any trees left that's where all the sandalwood oil went Ifra had no part to play in that Ifra had no part to play in that same thing with the frankincense, okay? And the musks, the animal musks, the deer musk, the castorium. There's cruelty involved with that. People don't want to have to murder those animals, and they weren't being bred. 
they, they, they didn't really have a musk deer farms. I mean, they might, they might have some now, but for the most part, they don't. So sustainability is something that nobody wants to talk about. A lot of your favorite materials are not gone because of IFRA. They're gone because the planet's not producing enough of them to meet demand. So we need those synthetics to fake it out, right? I mean, you can only imagine... If we just ate cherries so much that there wasn't enough cherry to go around, we had to just create artificial cherry flavoring. They did that with bananas for a while because the uh, the gross Michelle bananas were going extinct from uh, a, a, basically a genophage. So they created a gross Michelle banana flavoring that's still used now in candies and cookies, which is why whenever you take a bite of a banana flavored like cake, it doesn't taste like the bananas we have because the bananas we have now are a different breed. But the flavoring was modeled after the old breed that was going extinct from the genophage. So that's what I'm talking about. It's just, you guys got to think about sustainability sometimes. Now, a little bit of background history of IFRA, since you're probably wondering, well, how did it start all that stuff? 1973. IFRA started in 1973. And it started off and I believe it started off in Switzerland. I think it's based in Brussels now. I think Geneva is where it started. And now it's it's in Brussels. So it's moved over the years. But it is a European body. And it is mostly European fragrance manufacturers that belong to it although a couple from a few other countries do obviously you can't be international fragrance association if you're all coming from one country right it doesn't make sense so international flavors and fragrances based out of new york an american company they belong to it and takasago from japan belongs to it and a whole bunch of growers like i said a whole bunch of growers also belong to it so growers of naturals actually belong to IFRA. What does that tell you? <laughs> okay, what does that tell you? So must not be all that bad if the actual growers of the naturals that you think IFRA took away from you, you think IFRA took these naturals from you, why are these growers a part of this association? That the logic, you know, one plus one doesn't equal three guys. One plus one equals two. A will always equal A. All right? Logic. Start using some goddamn motherfucking logic. Superstition is not going to win the day. And I hear so much superstition on base notes. I see it in comments on Instagram, on this YouTube channel. All the weird magical thinking that constantly hits me. The weird cult-like religious thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is the most surefire way of getting yourself basically taken advantage of, is to have that mystical, magical, superstitious thinking. That is how you get led off a cliff, like a bunch of lemmings. You get led right off a cliff. Pied Piper plays your tune and you dance right along because you don't educate yourself. Stop that shit. Stop it. Stop. Get some help. <laughs> okay? It's smelly water. Enjoy it. Don't worry about what is or isn't in your bottle of smelly water. Does it smell good? Does it make you happy? Does it? Good. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Now, to cap this off. If a really formed around 73 because of the whole knee-jerk reaction to the nitro musks. You know, musk xylene, stuff like that. <clears throat> they couldn't, they were finding that the musks were going through the drain, going down the drain when you wash and shower. They were putting them in laundry soap too back then. And they found out that all the fish and all the seaweed and the plant life and the rivers and the streams were pumped full of nitro musks. That they weren't breaking down in the environment. They were so molecularly stable that they were staying and just like the mercury from the batteries that don't use mercury anymore, right? Mercury-free batteries nowadays, but used to have mercury in our batteries. The mercury was basically embedding itself in the tuna fish. Well, the same thing. The nitro musks were just 
embedding themselves in all the wildlife and that was just that was a bridge too far so that was one of the uh, genesis points for the creation of IFRA to say okay we don't want the government coming in and, and shutting us down so we will police ourselves and we will put forth advocacy about what we should and shouldn't use create standards for material production and usage and all that sort of thing right that was responsibility that was the industry trying to own its fuck up with the overuse of the nitro musks which led to some banning some aldehydes were also found to be actually cancerous actual carcinogens so had to remove those too clearly had to pull those out you don't want to one day end up with cancer because you wore your favorite perfume your whole life that would suck it's like all the people who used talcum powder and then didn't realize that talcum can sometimes have asbestos in it so if you use a whole bunch of talcum powder and you're not careful you could kind of sort of give yourself cancer i mean it's it's extremely unlikely you'd have to like really bathe bathe in talcum powder to even increase your risk slightly but some people man they had the shower to shower they put on every single day the johnson's every single day they were just head to toe powder and they got hit with the big c and it kind of sucks man and they sued and i'm sure they won something hopefully it paid for the treatment but you know these things happen guys science is science is a beautiful thing guys but it's not very forgiving it's not very forgiving it's a wondrous thing to behold but there's no margin for error with science not really now the other thing that i need to tell you about all this stuff is that not every perfume maker needs to conform to ifra see IFRA is not a governing body. It's just a self-policing advocacy group. So you can be a perfumer that makes and sells perfumes just in the United States, right? And all you got to worry about is the FDA. Even IFRA member groups can make non-IFRA perfumes for you if they're not being sold under that jurisdiction. You know, plenty of Avon fragrances were produced by IFF and they belong to IFRA but the fragrances they made weren't IFRA compliant because Avon wasn't selling them in places where that mattered right they were made locally sold locally it was just the FDA they had to adhere to FDA regulations that's it Europe far more stringent right the IFRA and the SCCS for better or worse kind of hold hands so if you want to sell a perfume in Europe, you kind of have to kowtow to the SCCS, which, as I said, Scientific Council of Consumer Safety, they are the real bogeymen. They are the real party poopers. They're the ones that are making it unfun, right, to be a perfumer. They're the ones really just chapping everyone's asses. The SCCS, not IFRA. But again... You make a perfume in China, the Chinese market, Chinese government's all that really matters. You know, that's, that's, these whole regulatory things really only matter if you're going to try and sell your perfume everywhere. And even the independents and artisanal folks that are IFRA compliant, like Rogue, like Manny Cross Rogue and Darren Allen, they're IFRA compliant just because they want to get their stuff in Europe. They want people in Germany and France and all that to sell their stuff and that's why they do it right and they do care about safety too they, they don't want to give you something that like i said is going to one day cause you to have health issues 15 20 years down the road that sucks again enjoying your favorite perfume and then one day like your lips fall off <laughs> nobody wants that but but getting a little rash or something or you know like i said that whole namby pamby thing i feel like if it's not a serious health hazard, it should just be a warning label. Warning, this fragrance contains oak moss, and that may cause you to have more sensitive skin to sunlight. Like, that's a reasonable warning label. That way you can choose to buy the product or buy a different one. But, you know, we're not there yet, I guess. But that's it, guys. That's IFRA. That's IFRA in a nutshell. And 
you know, the whole idea of why aren't why isn't oak moss in perfumes anymore? That's not that has nothing to do with Ifra either. There's also a little thing called tastes, and a lot of big companies these days they kowtow to popular tastes, or they want to make the cheapest possible perfume. Oak moss is not the cheapest material. So you have to go looking at the actual designers, the actual brands, the manufacturers, and put the question to them. Why are they not putting oak moss or whatever in your fragrances? Chances are it has nothing to do with regulation. It has everything to do with what costs the least amount and what will sell the most, right? Cost-benefit analysis, okay, CBA. That has everything to do with why you can't have nice things. That's something like IFRA. All right, guys, this has been the Unlist. I'll catch you.